and welcome to the Agricultural and Rural Issues Gubernatorial Candidate Forum hosted by the Nebraska Farm Bureau. This forum is being broadcast live as we speak by broadcast partners, Nebraska Rural Radio Association and Nebraska Public Media. I'm Susan Littlefield, Farm Director with the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. Here's the rules and structures for today. Each candidate will have one minute opening statement and introduction. Following the opening statements, a question and answer segment will begin where a panel of media reporters will ask questions and then each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to the question. There'll be no time followed for rebuttal. Following the Q&A portion, each candidate will have two minutes for closing comments. Our media panels for today include Lori Porter, an agricultural reporter and freelance journalist. Steve White, television reporter for NTV. Elizabeth Rembert, food, energy, and agricultural reporter for Nebraska Public Media. And the order of the candidates were selected by a random drawing that we did earlier today. The candidates include candidate one, Teresa Thibodeau. Candidate two, Brent Lindstrom. Candidate three, Jim Pillen. Candidate four, Charles W. Herbster. Candidate five, Michael Conley. And candidate six, Braylon Ridenauer. And with that, we will begin with our opening statements as we start with candidate one. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Farm Bureau, for putting this wonderful event on. My name is Teresa Thibodeau. It would be an honor to serve as the next governor to the great state of Nebraska. From being a small business owner to being in the state legislature to being a mom and many things in between, I have had a lot of experience and I've had experience with every level of government from city planning to the state level. And it's been one-on-one, -on -one, day to day experience. And I understand how the decisions in Lincoln affect everyday Nebraskans from the state legislature to bureaucracies who are making decisions for businesses, for farmers, that is making it hard for us to live our lives, pass our businesses and our farms down to our families, and I am ready to take on that role and make this about Nebraskans. Thank you. Our next can candidate, Brent Lindstrom. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me today, and thank you to the Farm Bureau for hosting and all the support over the years as I've served as a state senator, going back to my first election and the support that I've been given by you, so I appreciate that. Uh, I've worn many hats in, in my day, uh, as, as currently as a husband and a father, as a Husker, as a state senator, and now hopefully as governor of the great state of Nebraska. Over my time in the legislature, I've worked on a lot of different bills affecting all Nebraskans, and it's going to take that experience and that leadership and that next generation of leadership to accomplish what we need to do in the state of Nebraska to put us in a competitive situation for generations and years to come. And I look forward to this forum and talking about the issues because it matters to all of us and the success that Nebraska will have in the, in the generations to come. All right, thank you. Candidate three, Jim Pillen. Well, thank you everybody for being here. This is an incredible crowd and thank you for Farm Bureau for hosting us. I'm Jim Pillen. I'm a Christian conservative. I'm a veterinarian. I'm a pig farmer. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a father of four, I'm a grandfather of seven. Uh, I'm running to be your governor for the next generations of Nebraska. Uh, I'm a lifelong Nebraskan. I grew up on a tenant farm in Platte County, Nebraska. Grew up on the end of a pitchfork and scoop shovel with my brothers. Uh, Suzanne and I have been blessed beyond our imagination living here in Nebraska because of the people of Nebraska. Uh, I'm, that's why I'm here today. We've got a lot of work to do. We have opportunities to cut taxes, strengthen agriculture, uh, defend our values, uh, our conservative values for making Nebraska a special place. I'm asking for your vote so we can s defend our children, protect the unborn, so that we can cr work to have conservative values that's made Nebraska special. And so our number one economy, agriculture, can be strengthened. Thank you. All right, thank you. Candidate four, Charles W. Herbster. Mark, Susan, thank you so much for putting this event together. As a member of the Farm Bureau, all of you are going to have a very, very important and significant choice as we look at the governor's race in 2022. 
Uh, I'm a resident of Falls City, Nebraska, fifth generation, born on a dairy farm. We farm today. We have registered Angus herd. And then I own five companies in six different states, uh, along with employ people in all of those states. In Nebraska, we have an opportunity like no other state has. There's 49.6 million acres in our state. And of those acres, 44.6 million acres are dedicated to agricultural and rangeland. That's extremely, extremely important. Today, America is in a different place than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Today in America, we have issues that affect Nebraska, and as your next governor, I am more than ready to take those on and fight for every single Nebraskan in this state. Thank you. Moving on, candidate five, Michael Conley. Agriculture is a backbone of Nebraska. We have about 30% of what we produce gets exported overseas. That brings wealth back here into Nebraska. Now, we do have some problems that we have to work on or because if we don't take care of them in the future, Nebraska might end up being just a flyover state, as some people think it is. We have a lot of shrinking rural communities, and there are different things that we can do to take care of that. One of the problems that we have are new farmers that they try to start something up and they don't have the financial resources to begin something. Our education is another problem. In our schools, we don't need to have a STEM program, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We need to have a very strong STEAM program, the science, technology, engineering, agriculture, and mathematics. We also need to begin apprenticeship programs throughout our schools as well, so that way we can have our students well adjusted to staying in our agricultural areas. Thank you. And candidate six, Braylon Ridenauer. First and foremost, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here today. It is forums like this that allow the people an opportunity to see who is running to be their next leader. And I applaud you for taking the time to be here and prioritizing it over other pressing matters that I'm sure you have going on in your life. My name is Braylon Ryan. now I'm running for governor because I'm a middle class candidate. I, I'm a middle class Nebraskan running as a candidate because I've seen a lack of leadership in this country, in this state and this country, but also in the state that, a true, that I believe truly represents the majority of Nebraskans, the values, and is also willing to go great lengths to stand, stand and, uh, for what's important. First of those being constitutional rights. I'm a Republican, but I'm also a constitutionalist. I will protect, I'm gonna stand for, we're gonna enhance, and we're also gonna restore the constitutional rights that we've lost. Also using the Constitution to protect Nebraskans as well as our agriculture industry from federal overreach. Second thing, my background is technology. Okay. Technology. Sorry, I have to interrupt you. We have to stay on time. That's all right. We're time to move now to our comments and our questions coming, of course. Our first question will be coming from Lori Porter, Potter. Agriculture and rural communities have struggled with labor shortages all along the farm to table, uh, domestic and international supply chains. That has affected ag producers, food and fuel processors, and other ag related and main street businesses. And the state recently set a national unemployment rate record of 1.9%. As part of a solution, should Nebraska take a more positive and proactive approach to immigration policies and perceptions by assisting immigrants with legal, language, housing, and other issues that would allow them to fill some lingering job vacancies? All right, we'll start with Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. As far as the immigration issue, if those immigrants have come to our state legally, we should not be using state dollars or funds in order to help any immigrants that have come to our state illegally. Illegal immigration is bringing in uh, crime and it's an issue and it's hurting our public safety. If we have immigrants that are here legally and they want to take advantage of learning our English language and doing those things, we should support that. But we need to make sure that they are here and they are following the same rules that everyday Nebraskans follow. And yes, we do have a labor shortage. Everyone is suffering a labor shortage. And one of the ways to tackle that as well is not just looking at the immigration portion of it, but let's make our state more attractive to live in. 
and that is redoing our tax policy, looking at economic development, and making sure that our agricultural areas and our rural areas are attracting and keeping those young people here. And we need to do that in various ways, not only with the overall tax reform, we need to look at economic development. We also need to have those things available to young people that they want to see. And one of those is access to medical care, rural medical care. When we do all of those things, we will see our young people staying here. And I think we will be attracting more young people as well coming to our state when they can see all the beautiful things our state has to offer. All right, thank you. Mr. Lindstrom. Thank you. And Lori, you pointed out an interesting statistic there of 1.9% unemployment, which sounds good, but to me is an unhealthy percentage to have. 4% uh, is a more healthy economy to have in that particular framework of unemployment. Uh, but we do have a problem. And you look at what's going on, and we've taken some action. Uh, the agriculture community has stepped up in, in what's going on in North Platte, Nebraska, uh, with the meatpacking. Part of, the th part of the issue, though, is how do you fill those jobs? We have a huge uh, unemployment gap, uh, about 50,000 plus unfilled jobs in the state of Nebraska, probably more since uh, the last couple of years. So how do we tackle that? Uh, you know, a guest worker program is, is one of those things that we need to bolster, but we make sure the right people are here through uh, the, that guest worker program and the E-Verify e system. As we try to maintain and keep our younger people here, broadband, rural broadband is the number one thing that the governor needs to be involved in and make sure that that happens in, a, in an immediate fashion. I had the chance as I've traveled to meet with different groups. I was in Broken Bow and one of the families said that their student, their kid had to get, go up on top of a hill, ride a horse on top of a hill and hit the send button just to get one of their uh, um, uh, assignments submitted to, to the teacher. That's a huge problem. And so as a dad of three young kids, if you're asking our younger population to stay and maintain in rural Nebraska, you have to have some access to the outside world in the sense of, of rural broadband. And that is one thing the governor will have to take the lead on rolling into 2023. All right, Mr. Pillen. Well, this is, a, this is an incredible opportunity for our state. When I think about what's gone on in my lifetime in the state of Nebraska, how agriculture has changed, and how what kind of incredible opportunities it presents for us, uh, I just get blown away. I go back to our kids. It's all about our kids. It's all about our best and our brightest, and that we've really got to focus on stopping the brain drain to keep our best here now. Uh, we all in farming and agriculture and business uh, have to get in the game. Uh, I, I love to say that uh, our people, the people, us lifetime Nebraskans just take ourselves for granted. We think we're normal Joes and Susies. Well, the reality is we're extraordinary and everybody outside of our boundaries knows that and they've been taking our kids. Internships, keeping our best, getting our bottom half of the team and getting skill sets so everybody has a skill set to join into the 21st century. It's the key. It's the key for our future. Our agriculture is growing and producing more than ever before, and that's why we'll have such a bright, bright future. Getting broadband access immediately so there's a place for every one of our children uh, and selling our products. We can compete with anybody in the world. We compete with anybody in the world. Us Nebraskans have to sell and bring people here. We're the best there is, it's the best place. I'm excited for that future. All right, Mr. Herbster. Thank you. Broadband, each one of us up here, I'm sure, is going to have about the same answer, and that is how incredibly important to it, it is to us in Nebraska and anywhere. But certainly in this state, when you get out west and you have the opportunity to put young people to work in jobs, in high-tech positions, you know, Nebraska, you all know as Nebraskans here today, is one of the most beautiful, greatest states that we could possibly live in. I just came back from the border. I know what can happen with the illegals coming across the border, the drugs coming into every state, and what's taking place in crime. And yet, I also know the importance of legal immigration. That's how America was founded. All of us here are from some lineage that came across to America because they wanted to honor our flag, they wanted to honor God, they wanted to speak English, and they wanted to be an American. And on the legal side, we as a country need to work harder 
to make it possible so those people can come here, can e-verify, can work and do the things that are necessary to fill those jobs. And I assure you as governor, that will be one of the very, very first things on my list, along with the fact that you have to have property tax where you encourage people to stay, to live here, to not leave the state, and to come here. We can have all the agriculture, we can have all the technology, we can have all of those things here in Nebraska. We just need to market and brand the greatest state in the country. All Nebraska. right, thank you. Mr. Conley. Immigrants, should we assist them because of our labor shortages? Well, first of all, take a peek at our labor shortages. Why do we have the labor shortages everywhere? That's because of some of the policies they're pulling off in Washington, D.C. right now. Those will eventually bleed off. We probably won't have this problem in another six or seven months. I have lived over in foreign countries, and I've gone through all the, lived and worked in foreign countries, I've gone through all the procedures to become a legal worker in these other countries. Ours is a little bit more complicated than a lot of the other countries are. If we were to assist them, anyone who is here who just crossed over illegally, no, they're out. If we were to make anything, I would be open to making perhaps a small office on the other side of the border where they can register, we can assist them in doing legalities, we can make sure that they're legal before they come over here, they can hop through all the procedures. It is complicated, the U.S. immigration system is complicated. Now, as far as another shortage of workers, as Jim mentioned, we have a brain drain. We lose a lot of young people here. The, going back to the STEAM thing, we need to have agriculture taught more in our schools, and we need to have apprenticeship programs. Now, the education is going to be changing a lot probably next year. In fact, uh, you might notice there are some initiatives out there to replace the Department of Education. Thank you. Mr. Ridnauer. First off, I do support legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And if anybody comes in this country legally, they do not get benefits. And we do not need to take even legal immigrants and prioritize them over American citizens, right? With this, America was developed on, a, on a, a, a playground where you get to make out of it what you want. Now, I, we talk about the brain drain. The thing is, we're also not attracting people into Nebraska. In 2020, Nebraska only grew by 5,000 people. 5,000 people in this, this large, large state. That's a problem. We also need to make sure that those who are capable to work are not giving government benefits. Recently, recently our legislator voted to expand SNAP benefits. I think that's a bad idea. And how, do we, how else do we increase uh, labor shortages? I was mentioning earlier my background is like technology. We can use technology to make things more efficient to be able to operate. That doesn't mean we get robots everywhere, but there are things that we can do to be able to embrace technology because it's not the future, it is today, and we can use that to enhance our businesses, including the agriculture industry today. Thank you. All right, just a reminder for our candidates, we are doing this live on radio and television, so we do need to have you move the microphones closer to you as you speak. Our listeners and viewers would much appreciate it. And thank you again to Lori Potter for that first question. We are moving on now to question two with Steve White. Thank you all for being with us today. Well, I, I'm a dad of three who go to school here in Nebraska, and 30 years after our uh, tax system was reformed in what resulted in the finance formula we know as TO, so the majority of Nebraska schools received no state equalization aid. How would you, as governor, work with the legislature to address school funding? We'll start out with Mr. Lindstrom. Thank you for that question, and I'm actually in the midst of doing that as a state senator. We'll uh, most likely be carrying a large portion of that bill moving into next year. Uh, of course, we have a huge disconnect between the urban and rural divide. 244 school districts in the state of Nebraska, only 87 of those school districts get equalization aid. So therein lies a huge disconnect between what we collect at the state level, which is sales and income tax dollars, and how we backfill that need. Most of this is dealt on the local level and providing those on those services. Um, with the TOSA formula, just as a uh, just to give everybody an understanding, it's needs minus resources. And so over the years, since 1991, we have tried to change that over, over a long period of time, and now we've, we've stuck in this situation where most of the school districts don't get that equalization aid. The best way we can do it is go back to the original intent of, of the TIOSA formula, increase the allocated income tax portion from 2.23% up to 20%, and with 
uh, taking part of the sales tax dollars, about uh, half a percent, and put that into the, to, uh, lowering the local effort rate, we can ta take that maximum dollar amount down and give a 20 to 25 percent property tax reduction right away. That's not including what we've already done on the property tax credit relief fund, which is over a billion dollars. As governor, and even this next legislative session, because people are hurting, we are gonna make sure that we, that is a number one agenda of getting lower property taxes and reforming what we were set up in 1967. And if you'd like to continue with that question, I'd be happy to keep answering on that if you wanna follow up. Thank you so much. Mr. Pillen. <clears throat> well, this is, uh, I think, one piece of this t topic that everybody's gonna agree on our kids are our future, and we have to figure out a way to have fair and equitable solution for all of our kids across the state. Uh, use the number a little bit differently. 157 of the 244 schools districts in our state get no funding of equalization. Um, from my seat, we're Nebraskans. We're about being fair. We're about treating each other equitably that is just plain wrong. It's so plain non-Nebraskan. <clears throat> it's another piece, it's hard to fathom, but we have four districts out of that billion dollars, we have four districts that are getting half of that. So the TIOSA is incredibly complicated. I don't know as if I've found anybody that can really, really fully explain it. Maybe three or four people in the state. It's too complicated, it's too outdated. Uh, we have to change the formula, it has to be based. The state of Nebraska has an obligation to have funding for every student. That's the direction we gotta go and that's what I'd work at for, as your governor. Thank you. Mr. Herbster. We have worked very, very hard over the past many years to work and band-aid the property tax scenario in the state of Nebraska. Uh, I'm thankful to say that Senator Erdman, who's down here to my left, to one of the individuals that endorsed me, we've spent a lot of time talking on property tax in general, and we know that property tax is the funding machine for education. And I would just say that as the next governor of the state of Nebraska, uh, I have a very simple plan, and that is we have to rewrite the entire tax structure for our state. And that means we've got to look at every single thing. We have to look at entitlements. We have to look at a consumption-based tax. We've got to look at property tax. And we've got to look at the Teosa formula and what's taking place now in the education system. Parents in Nebraska should, number one, have the empowerment to choose the education choices for their children. That's incredibly important that we have public schools, we have private schools, we have charter schools, and we have homeschool. And we need to remember that parents should empower their children, empower their families to make those choices. And as governor, we need to empower them to make those choices because those are incredibly important. The future of the entire country is the young people who will become our next leaders. Thank you. Mr. Conley. Uh, education, actually, that's, that's my strong suit. I was the educational director overseas in Japan at a very high level academic school there for almost a couple of decades, worked for the Japanese Ministry of Education as well. They accomplish much more than we do on about half of our budget. We have a tremendous amount of waste in our education program. Now, one of the things that I would like to do, in fact, when you leave out there, if you stop over at my table, you'll see there are a lot of initiatives over there on the table. One of them is the one that replaces the Department of Education with its 500 plus employees that are sucking up a lot of the money that could be used for aid in all these different areas. And it will be replacing it with a small, efficient office of education with a lot of the various socialist programs and things like that snipped out. We, we spend a lot of money on technology in the classroom, excessive amounts. I know military members that travel around through the United States and they say Nebraska is extravagant in its technology, but if you walk into the classroom, half the kids are playing games on their computers instead of paying attention to the instructor. The instructor will say, check on your Google Classroom, message me at my desk if you have a problem. I worked in one of the schools to see what it was like. That is what it's like. Thank you. Mr. Ridenauer. 
Well, as it's already been mentioned, the funding model for our schools and our education system goes hand in hand with our property taxes. And as you probably know, the governor does not have the authority to change property taxes. So yes, we must work with the legislatures to be able to do that. First off, we need leadership that can help our legislators prioritize, to direct them to prioritizing uh, uh, legislation measures that will actually fix our property taxes because this is a top priority. It's not something that we just need to fix. It has to be fixed. It has to be fixed now. The other issue we find into, we've run into is reporting. 2019, only two state entities actually use proper reporting methods, a county and a city. We need to make sure we know where our money's going, who needs it, right, and who's getting too much of it. We also need to work with fixing this idea of use it or lose it. Oftentimes, I've seen that from military, healthcare, private sector businesses. This doesn't work. It results in a lot of waste of money. We need to have a plan that, that works with entities like schools to say, if you have money left over, bring it back to us. There's an incentive for you. We need to think outside the box and make sure we're addressing the problem with a whole 360 degree perspective and find a solution that's gonna be sustainable for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. We all agree this entire state needs to rewrite its entire tax code. That includes TIOSA. That includes scratching it and starting over. TIOSA is not working. It's not working for our students. It's not working for the rural areas of our state. And we all know that. In order to actually get a plan together, it can't just happen in Lincoln at the governor's office or the legislative. It has to happen on the local level as well. The governor is going to have to be a leader in getting the legislature, the cities, the counties, and the school boards at the table and making sure we get people elected to those positions in which their priority is redoing our school funding and redoing our tax system. You also are going to have to have people that are very, very bold because there are two very large unions in this state and they control a lot of reason why we cannot get tax, why we have not been able to get tax reform passed through our state. And I can tell you those unions don't care about what you're paying in taxes. They care about indoctrinating your students. They care about creating division. And they care about pushing through sex standards that nobody wants. And we need everybody from the governor's office on down to local elected officials to have that as their number one priority and to be ready to stand up against those lobbyists. All right, thank you. We are now headed on to question three this afternoon. This question will come from Elizabeth Rembert. Thank you, Susan. Uh, some of you jumped the gun on this, but I'd like to focus on rural broadband. How do you plan to support rural broadband developments, particularly in areas of oversight and accountability, to ensure that companies are using public funds to invest in internet access for rural communities? And with this, we will start with Mr. Pillen. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, I think everybody's agreeing in the 21st century, broadband access is essential. Uh, we are in an unprecedented time to grow our economy through the technology of broadband and bring countless kids home that are not going to have to go back to their office, but be able to move back because of our quality of life and our, because of, of uh, our educational system to educate their children here with their job. Lots of opportunities all the way around from a technological perspective perspective. Broadband has to be solved now. I'm a fiscal conservative, but I believe that we can't solve this problem out of excess cash flow that we have within our government, state government. I'm an advocate of doing bonding in a fiscally responsible way because we need to be able to solve this problem now. Uh, we have market holes, and that's where there's the opportunity for state to step up. Uh, much like the Rural Electric Association did 80 years ago. Uh, the other piece I think that's really important, it showed that uh, sometimes people are misled believing that we've got broadband everywhere, but in the very, very rural, rural uh, homes. Uh, we have broadband holes in a lot of communities. Uh, our education through the pandemic, we have a lot of kids that have been left behind. So we have markets that have to be solved, and then where there's large companies that have had the opportunity, we have to improve the accountability to get our value for our dollar. Thank you. Mr. Herbster. Wouldn't it be great 
if Nebraska could be the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. And we can do that. We all know that broadband is the key to keep those young individuals to bring businesses into the state of Nebraska, fill buildings like we have in Sydney that are now empty. We've got the opportunity to do that. In Falls City, we have great broadband and we're fortunate, we're blessed to have that because we had a great relationship between public and private money. And that's the way we can do that throughout the state. And as the next governor, I will lead the charge on making sure we can negotiate and put together an incredible broadband package from the east to the west. And that will change the number of people that we can stay and have stay in our state and attract business, tech business, along with our agricultural business, which will change our tax base and the number of people. You know, since 2010, We've only grown the population in the state of Nebraska by 135,000 people. We need to change that. And with property tax, with broadband, with the school education policies that we're talking about, we can change that. It'll make a difference. We need to brand and market Nebraska. Thank you. Mr. Conley. Well, I don't need to tell everyone the importance of broadband. You all know it. But what I would like to mention is how we go about doing it. I used to work in communication navigation systems in the military. And one of the things that we would do is we would carry around radiation detectors to make sure that we did not get excessive exposure from the antenna arrays. I have that. And when I drive through especially past schools, elementary schools, junior high schools, high schools, my radiation detector, I keep it with me still, it sings, it hits extreme high radiation levels and it buzzes. When we get our broadband, we need fiber optic cables. We don't need towers everywhere. Recently, I don't know how many of you follow the news, in India, they just pulled down many of the towers around the schools, hospitals, residential areas because of the extreme health risk. There was recently a court case in Washington, D.C. against the Federal Communication Commission. And the Federal Communication Commission lost, it was about all the towers popping up all over the place, 11,000 pages of evidence showing the dangers of the massive array of antennas. I won't even get into the security issues, but we need broadband, but we need to do it a safe way to not endanger the population. Check up the FCC court case on that to see what happened. Follow the news on that. Thank you. Mr. Ridenauer. Well, Elizabeth, you, what we need to do is we need to start by electing a leader that actually understands technology completely. And I've mentioned this many times. I'm an absolute proponent for broadband across rural areas, but how do we have accountability? Right? We're currently trying to do that. We're going to be spending $40 million to be able to expand broadband, but we have we have a plan that doesn't have any oversight. I talked to Governor Ricketts personally about this. Once they provide the, the, the statistics that they have to meet, they provide it in the beginning when it's set up, and then there's nothing after that. We can't verify that people are actually getting the speeds out of broadband that were initially advertised that they should be expecting. I know how this works. I've worked with internet service providers for many, many years. We need to have leadership that can understand this and flesh out these, these smaller, what we consider smaller issues that will become bigger issues, and we need people who understand how to get projects like this forward. And if we don't understand, we need to make sure we're getting the full 360 degree perspective on this to make sure that that's gonna happen. And we need that legislation to include all these clauses and make sure we're covering our basis. That comes with true leadership, oversight, and supervision of our projects. Thank you. Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. Uh, we all have known for a long time broadband has been a very important subject for our state and having access to it has been critical, especially uh, in the last uh, years over COVID when we did, when we had students who couldn't get access to the internet to, to uh, complete their schoolwork. In addition to broadband and, and making sure that those dollars that the legislature passed last session and, and that were just passed in the infrastructure bill are being spent wisely in our state and in the right way, we also need to have a vision, a vision for Nebraska and what does the future look like? Is the future truly broadband 
or by the time we get all that broadband laid, are we all of a sudden behind in technology again? We're seeing a lot of opportunities with satellite. It's cheaper than broadband, there's opportunities there, and it's more safe and secure and harder to hack when you're doing your, your uh, technology through, through satellite than actually relying on the broadband. We need broadband right here and now, it's an immediate need, but we need to make sure that we're not just responding to right here and now. We have to have a vision in what is Nebraska going to look like 10 years from now, and we need to make sure we're including all of those things in our plan. Thank you, Mr. Lindstrom. The goal is to become Silicon Prairie. And we have several things in front of us that we can do right now. We have ARPA funds. The uh, federal government just passed the, the uh, infrastructure bill uh, just recently. So Nebraska, in, in the years that I've spent as a state senator, will have this next session more money than it knows what to do with in the sense of how do we deploy. And the governor currently is working with the legislature and other parties to make sure that we lay out a, a plan that covers all Nebraska. But because of the short time that we have, the next governor will have to be carrying on the legacy of maintaining that and making sure that it reaches all places. As governor, I will make sure that I do that. The way you do that is to make sure you have a conversation with local officials, local mayors, uh, to work with the local communities to make sure that we meet the needs for those communities and for the future of those kids. That goes hand in hand with reforming the tax code. It goes uh, with the infrastructure bill. It goes with building out our, our roads. It also go ties into workforce housing. So when all these things come about, it is, it is working with your local officials, your mayors, your county officials to make sure we are deploying this in the proper way to create that Silicon Prairie, to keep residents here, especially the next generation. And as governor, I will make sure that that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. As we continue on now, we'll bring Lori Potter back on to ask her next question. State incentives were used years ago to promote the construction of uh, ethanol plants in Nebraska and help the state now play second in corn-based ethanol production. Should similar or other incentives, incentives be offered for other projects that could add value to major ag commodities, such as other types of biofuel plants or the beef processing plant that is proposed at North Platte, but also for niche crops. For example, state licensed farmers in this area who grow hemp for the CBD and CBG supplement markets say that industry can't grow unless the state changes regulations limiting use of the entire hemp plant, including the biomass as livestock feed, and also offers incentives to process hemp fiber. So again, she's asking you to ask and answer, should similar other incentives be offered for other projects that could add value to our commodities in the state? And we will start out with Mr. Herbster. Well, certainly ethanol is huge here in the state of Nebraska. Uh, it takes 35% of all the corn that we raise in this state. And we have 25 facilities across the state. And it's more than just the ethanol, it's also the grain that comes for the cattle industry and the dairy industry uh, that happens when you process that in an ethanol plant. I had the chance to visit Kappa here uh, just a few weeks ago and go through all the process that they go through. It's, it's amazing for people to understand a lot about the production of ethanol. I would just say this, anytime we look at giving money to other points of business in the state, we just have to make sure that we get a return on investment. And part of the property tax dilemma that we have as we look into it is where is the money going and how is it being spent? I think all of you here understand how it is. You only have so much money that you can spend out of your monthly income. Now, the United States government is the only place of business that I've ever seen that can just continue to print money and spend. That doesn't work well in the state. It doesn't work well for local businesses. So I would just say as governor, I'm going to be open-minded to anyone that has the availability and the return on investment and can show that if we can add this to the state, it'll add jobs, it'll add benefits, and it'll pay itself over a period of time. Thank you. Otherwise, it's so not a good we're out investment. Of time. Mr. Conley. All right. 
aid for other types of agricultural technology things. First of all, let me hit the uh, cattle one. Uh, probably many of you are aware that right now they're the four big uh, cattle operations. Uh, two of them are owned by Brazil. One is owned by China. The other one is owned by the big Cargill Corporation. Yes, we need to work and strengthen all of the different things that help our industries here in Nebraska. Having been former military in the Marines, I was military intelligence, a few other fields, I know that security is important. Here in Nebraska, our security is agriculture. For example, in our cattle industry, we are not secure in our cattle industry. We've got all these various countries and some wealthy family in a different state controlling our cattle industry. We need to have, well, I saw you visited Rusty Kemp the other day. Yeah. We need to uh, do things like that with the North Platte facility. As far as the ethanol, yes, we need to have a bio biodiesel, we need to have ethanol, all of those other areas because do we make gasoline and a lot of other fuels here in Nebraska? No, that's, that doesn't happen here. In case of any future problem situations, we need to have at least a base industry that we can progress upward. As far as paying for all of this, hey, we need to just take some scissors out and cut a lot of the wasteful parts of our government that we don't need, which will allow us to invest in a lot of these agricultural areas to strengthen Nebraska industry and our security. Thank you. Mr. Ridenauer. Well, that's actually a very easy question. Uh, do we want to, so what you're asking is, should we take our money and reinvest it back into our own state and to our people? It's an easy answer of yes. But, yes, we need to make sure we have full spectrum research to make sure that the money and the dollars, taxpayers' dollars that we're investing will provide a good and long-term sustaining return of investment. Um, so with that being said, though, if, if there's a market for things like hemp, and according to my research, that's a very vastly growing uh, market, then yes, let's, be, let's consider all our opportunities and, and let's consider everything that's going to be helping Nebraskans. Right, uh, and if we can put money towards that, and that's what will actually fix, that will help that grow. Then yes, money doesn't solve all problems, though. So we need to make sure we're conservative and how we're spending that. Uh, also, I want to consider where is that money coming from? Is it is it state tax dollars or is it federal? Because if it's federal, then we may run into an issue. Now, I'm a conservative, and I believe we need to start weaning ourselves off from the federal government. The problem is, is that federal government, when they give money, they also have strings attached to that. That's not good. So I want to make sure that the money we're investing is not going to come back to bite us in the end. Thank you. Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. If we could not get overall tax reform um, implemented in our state, we have no other, other choice but to continue to offer incentives. I get a little skeptical of incentives. I think they are great if they are keeping young people here or we're moving on to the next generation of farmers and ranchers. Those are wonderful. We wanna make sure though that those incentives do not pick winners and losers. We wanna make sure that we're actually giving them to the people that need them, the people that are just getting started and the people that are bringing in new ideas and new opportunities to our state. For example, hemp. That is a new opportunity that we can look at. That is something that our farmers can use their land to produce, and that's not a bad thing. But let's make sure we make those incentives set up so that we can't end up creating a monopoly and having large corporations possibly using that incentive to pay new or emerging farmers to grow or do something just for them, and therefore controlling the market or controlling costs and making it impossible for other farmers to get into the market or to do business. So we definitely just need to make sure that those are done in the right way and that we are not picking winners and losers when incentives are offered. Thank you. Mr. Lindstrom. Well, with the question of ethanol, I am very pro-ethanol. If you look back through the economy the last 10 years, we've had ups and downs. Uh, when the stock market and a lot of the business community in Omaha and Lincoln uh, floundered during 08, 09, the egg community across the state of Nebraska picked it up. And a lot of that was in, in due to the fact that we had other supply and demand outlets that are tied in with ethanol. When it comes to the renewable chemical side and looking at other steps, I've actually done it. I have passed a bill that did a tax credit working with ADM, Bio Nebraska, 
and other groups to do a tax credit off those offshoots of what ethanol was 20 years ago. This is the future of Nebraska. Uh, with those products, we can do algae for uh, salmon farms. But when you look at building out these economies and these spokes, if you will, ADM, companies like that, not only do you have huge investments, uh, workforce, but also you have spokes that are built off with other companies that are built up around it that are innovative. And it all goes back together on how we grow Nebraska. Sometimes we do have to do incentives if we're going to get something off the ground, particularly in the uh, research and development phase or the startup phase. Of course, we do need to get our tax code under control, but at times we need to do things to incentivize Nebraska companies to take their ideas and to grow them into bigger companies that help us all. And I am very much pro doing that, and we'll do that and continue to do that as governor. All right, thank you. Mr. Pillen. <clears throat> I vividly remember uh, January 2 of 07 when President Bush gave the State of the Union and the night that the renewable fuel standard was enacted. I believe there's no place in the world that has benefited more than the state of Nebraska. Our ag economy has flourished by more crop production, the ethanol industry exploding. Hope everybody's filling their tanks with E10, by the way. And, uh, and what it's done to grow, my definition of value-added agriculture is livestock. Our cattle industry's almost d doubled. It has, it's had a huge impact on the pig industry. So. The, the renewable stand, fuel standard is huge. The ethanol industry has grown and allowed our families to bring kids home and allow our communities to grow. It's a, it's a big, big deal. Uh, I'm a believer at the state level that we need to stand up and have less government and have business solve our problems. When I talk, of, when I hear about incentives and picking winners and losers, it just flat ticks me off. I don't, it makes no sense. The market should do, do we have great opportunities for value added agri agriculture, but the market needs to make that happen. I'm a believer in business solving the problems, get government out of the way. Thank you. I just received two text messages, candidates, asking you to please move your microphones a little bit closer once again so they can hear you better on the radio. One gentleman said he's in his tractor and would like to be able to hear your responses, so thank you. As we, as we do continue on, we'll bring Steve White back in to ask the next question. Steve? Yeah, and speaking of the tractor, I spent a lot of time in those uh, interviewing folks, a lot of them who are here today who are Farm Bureau members. And if there's a topic that inevitably comes up as I'm in, uh, riding in the buddy seat during, during harvest or whatever I'm doing, uh, it's this, that our egg producers shoulder a large burden for funding schools. We talked about school funding earlier, but more specifically, the broader tax code situation. I'm getting alerts on my phone, uh, urging me to buy my Christmas presents online and that kind of thing. So considering how our world has changed, do we currently have the proper balance of sales, income, and property tax? And we will start with Mr. Conley. Do we have the proper balance? One of the biggest problems we have with taxes is not right now, not currently our balance, which when the government sets things up, you always know they screwed up. They never get anything right the first time. The biggest problem we have is we waste a tremendous amount of money and we spend money that we shouldn't be spending. Imagine if you went through some of the programs, say Health and Human Services, we've got all of our nice welfare program. How about if we changed it into something like a welfare work program where they come in and they sign up and you hand them a shovel or a notebook, which one would you prefer for your welfare work program? There are a tremendous amount of programs that we can change and save a lot of money. But as far as the overall balance of everything, I am not familiar with all of the balance. If anyone would like to give me comments on how they would like to change some of these things, if they don't have balance or maybe unfair for this individual or unfair for that individual, send me a message. You can find out about me, I didn't have time in my first 60 seconds, at uh, voicesofnebraska.com. Go ahead and comment there. Tell me any of the comments you have about the taxes because anything I know is small compared to the mass of all of you. Tell me your ideas, tell me your opinions, tell me what you think is missing, the imbalances that we have. Send it to me so I can work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riddenauer. So when you say balance though, that means that we're including a little bit of everything. And I don't think we need to balance taxes. 
we need a tax code that actually works for Nebraskans. Now, if that's a tax code that prioritizes one tax over the other, let's say consumption tax, which I'm a proponent for, then I believe that's gonna be the answer. It makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of proposals out there for consumption tax that will, that will better, uh, better Nebraskans and will actually bring in more revenue yet reduce the taxpayer's uh, uh, bill. And that's what I support. However, again, a governor doesn't have the authority to change the taxes, the legislature's does. So we need leadership, again, like I said before, that will help legislators prioritize our tax code and be able to change it. I'd like to see a consumption tax that eliminates the inheritance tax, eliminates income tax, and eliminates our property tax. Thank you. Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. That, uh, that balance has been out of balance for, for many, many years, and Nebraskans have been suffering for many years, uh, mostly on that property tax issue, and it is affecting the agricultural communities so much. And most of those communities who are being affected by that so much aren't even in the equalized school districts. So not only is it out, out of balance, it is, it is affecting our rural communities the most. And we really do need to reform the entire tax system. It is going in and looking at all of those. It also looks at our inheritance tax. The inheritance tax is making it impossible for farms to continue and go on generation after generation. Because when somebody, their farm is passed down to them, they not only get hit with a huge inheritance tax bill, they're then hit with a huge property tax bill. And they don't even have enough money to keep the farm in business. There's all areas, again, rewriting the tax code, tax reform across the board, and it can't just be done at the governor's office or in the legislature. It needs to be done as well at the local, cities, counties, and school boards. That's the way that we get overall tax reform done. We also have to look at our spending. There are so many areas where we can reduce spending and government waste. We have to look at those. It's an obligation for the government to reduce that spending. Thank you. Mr. Lindstrom. So we have a 1967 tax code, and over that time frame, we have put Band-Aids over it. We have eroded that tax code. We have 175 different exemptions in the tax code. To get Nebraska in a competitive situation, we need to break it down into its fundamental core. And we can no longer penalize people for making money by, in the tune of income tax, and we can no longer penalize people for owning property in the tune of property tax. I think most people would agree on pay, saying yes or no to a product. I do have a problem with, a little bit with a problem with the consumption tax side of things. If we were to implement that, uh, you lose a lot of local control with the counties. Uh, the other aspect of it is the premium tax on insurance companies that would force a lot of companies domiciled here to leave Nebraska and 15,000 employees to also leave with it. Uh, I have taken steps over the last couple years to make sure Nebraska is in a competitive situation. I passed the largest tax cut in the last two decades with Social Security tax, a $168 million deal, and that'll be phased out over 10 years. We also took steps uh, to eliminate the military retirement. So as we look at this, and the governor will have to lead the charge in conjunction with the legislature, because it, it is long overdue. The, the political will to get this done, and I, I've traveled the state, everybody knows that we need to do it, it's just having the political will to do it. And with this three-legged stool that, that people talk about, or a third, a third, a third, to me it's just outdated. It's not, it's not where the economy is, and we do not operate in the 1960s, uh, in 1960s and therefore we have to adapt and, and make sure that we are meeting the needs of the future. All right, thank you. Mr. Pillen. Well, needless to say, it's time for transformative tax change. Uh, it's essential. Nebraska has to have it happen to become competitive for our future generations. Uh, to get it a perspective, the three-legged stool, the property tax is so out of whack that you, if you had to milk a cow, you wouldn't get anything done. We don't have any future for our state of Nebraska with the property tax so far out of balance. It has to get solved. It has to get solved and it has to get solved now. I believe the time is right for transformative change because today it affects every single Nebraskan in the state. It affects people that are paying rent for an apartment and it's affecting where people are buying their homes and it's affecting our property on farms and ranches. 
Uh, I'm a believer that uh, we take a look at a thought process, the assessment is just not fair for ag land. Uh, assessing our property as it continues to go up does nothing but continuing to rise our property tax. Uh, business would say it makes total sense to do like we do in business and have an income-based approach because then we're in business and we can pay taxes. The other piece that's really, really important in this whole conversation is spending. Remember, remember, we write our property taxes to our local governments. I'm a believer in local control in our local governments, and all of us have responsibility in helping hold our neighbors accountable for what we spend. All right, Mr. Herbster. John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. There isn't one person here that doesn't realize the importance of rewriting and restructuring our tax base to make this state more available for businesses to come, for families to live here, educate their children, keep their children here. As I said earlier, 44 million acres is dedicated to farmland and ranch land, and that land is gonna pass from one generation to the next. And if we cripple those individuals by the taxes, not only the property tax, the inheritance tax, all the things that's been talked about up here, you will very quickly not allow those young people to continue a fourth or fifth or sixth generation that's been built here in the state of Nebraska. I have said more than once across the state that as governor, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in Lincoln, I'm gonna spend it all across the state because all of you and I think most people across the state are ready to take a change. They're ready to look at the exemptions. They're ready to look at a consumption-based tax. They're ready to look at the things that are necessary to make our state attractive like South Dakota, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, and the list goes on. I commit to you I'll do that in two years as the governor of the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Our next question will come from Elizabeth Rembert. Now I'd like to ask about the environment and climate. I'm wondering what does sustainability, environmental, and climate action in ranching and farming look like to you? And how would you plan to support farmers, ranchers, and rural communities in their environmental efforts? Our first answer will come from Mr. Ridenauer. So the first thing we need to do is be open to what the Nebraskans need, right? What do our communities need and what are they trying to accomplish? Now your question doesn't really nail down any political or any uh, particular climate or environmental issue. Uh, so I'm gonna have to give you a broad answer on that. Uh, as governor, I'm an individual though that I like to use common sense. At least I try to as often as possible. We look at these issues, we try to say what's gonna work, find a solution, understand the problem, again, 360 degree perspective. Understand every angle of the problem, identify a solution that's gonna work. Uh, as for the environmental issues for farmers and ranchers, we wanna keep the government out of the way, state or federal. That's what I wanna see do, right? We don't wanna impose regulations, but we just wanna protect the people. And so being able to get out there, listen to the people, meet with them, have these town halls, connect with them, find out what kind of solution we can put in place and work with them on that solution is gonna be the best approach in my opinion. All right, thank you. Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. Our farmers and ranchers have always been good stewards of our environment, of the land that, that, they, uh, that they farm, um, of the water that they use. Uh, you wouldn't see people who care more about our environment or take care of our resources like the farmers and ranchers do. And that's the great thing about the wonderful people of Nebraska. There's no need to put regulation on them in order to ensure that they're taking care of, of the farmland and the natural resources that they use each and every day. And there's a lot of other areas where farmers are at the forefront of this, where there are people who are using the free market, and I'm a very big proponent of free market in dealing with things. So although our farmers and ranchers are great at taking care of our resources, there are things coming down, unfortunately, from the federal government. And we have great examples right here in our state of how the free market is, is dealing with them. We have great examples of how we are using ethanol so that we do not put the ethanol uh, plants out of business and that we don't take away ethanol production from our farms. We are 
leading the charge on making ethanol carbon neutral. And that is one of the great things I love about Nebraskans. When we all sit down together, we make the best solutions. And allowing it to come from the free market and Nebraskans themselves and the ones that are doing it each and every day is the best solution. Thank you. Mr. Lindstrom. Water is a huge aspect of this conversation and discussion. And with the Ogallala Aquifer, and as I've traveled through places like McCook and Arapaho, and we talk about the recharge in a lot of our resources across Nebraska irrigation, it's vitally important to the success of the agriculture community. Uh, if you remember years ago, we got in a back and forth with Kansas in, in an issue that dealt with water, Republican River Valley. That is gonna come to fruition in the sense of what we, what we do towards Colorado or to Colorado, where the next governor may have to take a law or put up a lawsuit against Colorado with the mi uh, migration from California into there and their growing population that hurts agriculture in the western part of, of Nebraska. It may come to a point where we may have to sue them. Uh, on the other side of it, what do we do to incentivize our ag community to uh, for conservation. They're already very, very good stewards of that, but there are new technologies that we are working towards in this aspect. And I'm on the forefront of working on a tax credit uh, that I've already put out there dealing with precision agriculture. And what it does is it, it provides sensors, not mandatory, but voluntary, for our producers to measure the water that they're inputting into their business. To me, it makes sense from a cons conversation, cons conservation level, excuse me, but also a business sense. Uh, when you have less input into your business, you have more ROI or, or return on investment. So I think there's a, a good way of balancing that, of making sure that we move towards precision ag using, again, going back to the broadband and how we expand upon that throughout rural Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. Pillen. This is a subject that I, I just really, really get fired up, spending my life in agriculture and the, the incredible practices that have taken place by all the farmers and ranchers across the state of Nebraska in my lifetime. Uh, we have increased productivity 5X in the hills in Platte County when I was a kid. If we could raise 60 bushel, we were happy. This year, we ticked over 300. It's all about our land, our five agroecological zones that are incredibly complicated. By the way, we don't need the federal government telling us what the heck to do with them. Uh, number two, our water. That Ogallala Aquifer is the unbelievable pot of gold and the resources. It's really important. All Nebraskans have been practicing it for generations to protect our water and our surface waters. Title 130 became law in 1972. We've adapted and we have, it's the most stringent environmental law in the United States and we've adapted and we've all made money because of it. It's made our businesses better. Uh, the thing that's really important and we can be sustainable, growing our agriculture, using our water from that pot of gold and continue to raise more and process it here. It's important for us to realize we feed the world we feed the world here in Nebraska and we save the planet. And as your governor, I'll work my tail off to help all of our producers continue to grow that and sell that product around the world. We're the best at it anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Herbster. Well, all of us wanna make Nebraska grow and prosper. And so I would just simply say this, it's been proven over and over again when you have less taxes, less government, less regulation, less control, that the American free enterprise system will thrive. And as your governor, I'm committed to have less of all of those. We're being totally constrained today with our freedom losses of being told what to do, not only from the federal government, but sometimes even from state government. Less of all of those things will make all of our businesses prosper and it will attract new people into our state and it'll attract keeping young people here to continue to be the producers of agriculture, not only for the United States, but for the world. Thank you. Finally, Mr. Conley. How do we support farmers and ranchers and environmental concerns? I have to tell you a short story. A man was riding along one day and he saw this beautiful farm with the, with the wonderful fields and the trees all lined up and everything was very well taken care of. And he hailed the farmer as he saw the farmer go by and he said, God has blessed you with a wonderful farm. And the farmer said, yes, he has, but you should have seen it when he had it all to himself. You see, 
for some reason, our federal government, in fact, a lot of people have these bizarre ideas that we need to have control the farmers as if they don't want to take care of their own property, as if they don't want to make it the very best they possibly can. Most people aren't aware that currently we are in a mini ice age. When I was in high school, we were worried about if we we're going to go into a full-blown ice age and the entire North American continent would be covered over again. Now we're creeping slowly out of a mini ice age into a average period. The Northwest Passage, a fabled Northwest Passage, is still frozen up. We still can't go through there. Do you know in this carbon credit things that they try to pull, they, India and China, when they have people do something for carbon credits, they took the hydrofluorocarbons, made a manufacturing company for them. Beside it, they made a destruction company. They produced them, they destroyed them. We paid them money in our little environmental protection programs and they made a lot of money off of us. And I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, lucky for you guys as candidates, we have time for another question. What we have done to those in the audience, those that are viewing and those that are listening, each one of our panelists submitted one extra question of which I will ask. Uh, timekeepers, is the time reset to one minute? All right, you will have one minute to answer this following question. What should be priorities for use of Nebraska's portion of federal infrastructure funds that should most help farmers, ranchers, and rural communities thrive? And we'll start with Ms. Thibodeau. Thank you. Uh, the first priority for the federal relief funds is we need to make sure that we are investing in, in projects that will increase revenues for the farmers and also make sure that we can look at those funds and see what areas we can use them in and make sure that we do not fund any new pet projects, that we're not looking to spend more money, create new pet projects because at the end of the day, our focus needs to be to get to a point where we can provide tax relief. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll get the clock reset, please. Mr. Lindstrom. Uh, two main areas here that need to be a one-time spend, uh, not an investment in something that needs to be ongoing necessarily, but something we can really interject into our society and making sure that our commerce uh, are succeeding. We've covered a lot of that with the broadband infrastructure, and that's a huge priority, number one in my book. But there's also the issue of roads funding. And as you travel the state of Nebraska and you look at our two-lane highways, we're in uh, deficiency in our four-lane highways. If you travel from Norfolk uh, down high two, uh, 275 into Omaha, uh, that does not help commerce. And I, I go back a few years okay. ago. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, your minute up. That minute goes fast. I know. I apologize. It's not stopping. It's one minute. They have one minute for this one. Oh, my apologies. And you still have 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go for it. No, that's okay. But when you, when you travel to say Nebraska and you look at getting from a, a product from point A to point B. Go ahead. I'll let you finish your <laughs> last few seconds. It, it creates a very difficult situation. You know, you had floodings that went on and the icebergs that broke apart. Uh, bridges in rural Nebraska and Stewart, Nebraska, and we need to spend money on making sure that our ag producers aren't driving miles and miles out of the way to get their product from point A to point B, and that goes across the entire state of Nebraska. If you're in Shadron trying to connect with Rapid City, okay. that in incentivizes uh, people to come here as well, and so that's a huge important investment for me. All right, thank you. Mr. Pillen. Well, we have uh, great opportunities for roads and for broadband, but let's take it a different direction. Our federal government's out of whack. What has gone on in the Biden administration is uh, incredibly crippling. There's three words to describe it. Big government socialism. Uh, could we use some money for roads, broadband? Maybe, but not, not today. They're not that bad. We need to wait until the conservatives get back in charge, and then we get, a broad, we get money and use it correctly. Spending money and printing money and spending more money. As your governor, the, the federal government is, we're not going to take all money at all costs from the federal government. Uh, that's just pure, simple hogwash. All right, thank you. Mr. Herbster. America's broke. We continue to dole out money. There's no possible way that we can continue to do that. And if we continue to do it at a national level, we'll continue to see states do that. 
And so I would just simply say this. Anytime we take even 50 cents from the federal government, there's an attachment of a rule or a regulation or a control, and that will hurt this state. It will not help the state. All right, Mr. Conley. Priority for federal funding. Whew. Wow, it's, uh, it's hard to not agree with all these guys on the table. There was something called a Brenton Woods Agreement after World War II, and that made the US dollar the world reserve currency. Because of that, our federal government can print money anytime they want to, and every other country in the world has to bear the same inflation that we do because they have to carry our currency with us. They are throwing money at everything, and as Charles mentioned, a lot of it has strings attached to it. First of all, you need to see, are there any strings attached to this federal money? And if not, don't try to decide something quickly. Look at everyone, and if you do spend it, look at something that is going to give you the greatest return. But always watch for the federal strings, because they normally have them attached. Thank you. And Mr. Ridenauer. So it is true that the American government, or American country of America, is broke. It is true, but we can't ignore the needs that we have here in our country and in the state of Nebraska. So here's some of the things that I would like to see that money spent on. One, Nebraska is known for being the state with horrible roads. We need better roads. Uh, next thing would be broadband as well as reinvestment into Nebraskans as we previously talked about, such as getting local startups of meat processing uh, plants, uh, as well as tax relief. And, uh, and building, building an infrastructure. You see, we're not bringing, we don't have an infrastructure already made. We have businesses who actually want to come to Nebraska, even with our current tax structure. And they say, we don't want to be there because we don't want to wait two years for you to build the roads, build, uh, get the electrical grid in place. They don't want to come and wait for that infrastructure to be built. We don't have that. And that's even in the metropolitan area. We don't have that. We need that because we build it and they will come. All right, thank you. It is now time for closing comments to come from all six candidates. Each candidate will have two minutes to share their final thoughts. And we will start out with Mr. Lindstrom. Well, again, thank you for having me here today, and I appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, this election really is about the future of Nebraska and with the generations to come. As a dad of three young kids, this is why I'm in this race, is to make sure that they have a bright future. The two things that stand out to me is experience and next generation leadership. What we talked about here today, it, it's going to take experience to, to hit the ground running January 2023. Having relationships around the state capitol and working with the senators I have, two thirds of them will continue to be there. We will be able to take on these challenges facing Nebraska in a hurry. And we will, we will do that. It's all going to come down to political will. Rising above all the special interest, power, and money that reside in Nebraska that force us to pit each other against one another. But having that experience to overcome it and point to the success that I've had in the legislature, passing 60 bills, passing the biggest tax cut we've done in decades, all those things matter on the experience on how to get from point A to point B to how to get something done. And that does matter. Next generation leadership matters. Having the energy to go out and work hard and get these things accomplished. Because frankly, generations, we've been talking about these things for 20 years, 20 years plus. In the case of the tax code, 1967, a long time. And we're just now starting to address some of these things. So it's gonna take bold leadership to hit the ground running and make sure that we put ourselves in a competitive situation in 2023 and far beyond that. And as your governor, I will make sure that that happens day one. All right, thank you. Mr. Pillen. It's an incredible privilege when I think about how I grew up and my brothers are here, we couldn't rub two quarters together that I'm standing before you to be considered your next governor. It's incredibly, it's incredibly, incredibly important. The next 10 years are the future. Uh, the next 10 years are going to be more impactful than anything that's taken place since the founding of our state. Uh, I have lived my entire life in the state of Nebraska. I've raised my family in the state of Nebraska. Uh, I've made my living in agriculture in the state of Nebraska. I know the people of the state of Nebraska, and I know the state of Nebraska. Our future is all about our kids. It's all about our kids, and we need to make sure that we keep them here, and we need to make sure that our kids 
uh, are all skilled. We have 25,000 kids graduating. Half of those kids are not getting skill set. We need internships to make that happen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a believer we have to decrease taxes and we have to come together and, and grow and strengthen agriculture and defend our conservative values. I'd be honored and privileged to receive your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbster. Well, first of all, thank all of you for being here today. And I just say to all of you that I am committed to make a difference in this great state of Nebraska. People ask me all across the state as I travel, why are you running for governor? And my answer is because I'm concerned about the entire nation called the United States of America. I'm concerned about the fact that in the last seven months, we had a total disaster as we left Afghanistan. We've had a total disaster on the southern border. People say, well, that doesn't really affect Nebraska. Let me share something with you. An open border affects every county, every city, every state. There's no question that that will change the entire culture. We have $400 million worth of drugs coming into the United States across the southern border every single month. I have a good friend in the state of Nebraska that the other day said, I haven't said a lot about this, but let me share with you, I have a nephew here in Nebraska. He took a pill one night. He was never into drugs. It had fentanyl in it, and he died. And so besides the property tax and the other things that we've talked about, critical race theory, allowing parents to be involved in the curriculum, in the education system, in their school systems for their children, and building businesses and, again, taking the state of Nebraska, putting, a, putting the state logo on everything that we manufacture, everything that we produce. If we're going to build a great state, we've got to go outside the state. We've got to go outside the country. I've built businesses in 40 states across the country. It is going to take bold leadership. It's going to take bold, bold, bold leadership. It's going to take a fighter. And I would just say to all of you, I will fight for you like you've never seen before. And it would be an honor Thank to you, be sir. the next governor. Mr. Conley. All right, two minutes. That's a lot longer than 90 seconds. First of all, I would like to say the, these guys up here and lady gal as well they all have to uproot themselves from their lives and they have to work and put themselves out there in front of everyone and it is my request that when you ask them about their policies treat them with respect and treat them with consideration and don't be slinging mud around and talking about how this is bad or that is bad every one of them is going out of their way disrupting their personal lives just so they can come here and run now I have a team of individuals that will be running with me. When I say team, I mean team. That uh, voicesofnebraska.com, it's not just me. I have someone who will be running for attorney general, someone who will be running for secretary of state as well. Uh, the current treasurer, I love that guy. I want to keep him. But uh, we have various different points that are very important to me. Like one of them is, well, the education. I mentioned that before. I won't beat that horse anymore. Uh, another one is medical freedom. And I'm going to list these things because right now I've got initiatives sitting outside on a table that I would love it if you would all sign these. These are all Western Nebraska value conservative type of issues that we can push to get on the ballot in November. It's like, hey, why wait around for an election before you start getting the things done? And uh, all these guys should love these because it'll give them that much less work when they get in there if they do. But um, we've got a few things. One that I want to mention is election integrity. Now, I don't know how many of you people are really good at analysis and statistics and watching all the details of elections, but there were a lot of problems in there, and we've got them in Nebraska as well. Medical freedom, the medical vaccine mandates that they have here. When they start pushing you around and telling you that you have to get a stick, what else will they start pushing you around on? You need to have... Thank you, Mr. Rudenauer. Well, first off, thank you again for your time and attention today. I appreciate it. I know we all do. Uh, you know, Mr. Herbster is right. We need, we need bold leadership. We need somebody who has the passion, the strength, and the energy to be able to stand up every single day for the next four years and beyond. 
Now, if you haven't noticed, I'm, I am the youngest candidate up here, and I have a lot of energy and I have a lot of passion. And I believe that I'll be able to add, I'll be able to add that to our leadership uh, in this state. The next thing is, is we need leadership that can work with people. This state isn't just Republicans. I'm running on a Republican ticket. Obviously, I'm a bit biased. But there are people with great ideas that we may not like. They probably don't like me, a few of them. But we still got to work together because they're elected officials. And we got to get some change. We need meaningful change in this state, and I'm able to accomplish that. The next thing is fighting the CSC, CRT, standing up for medical freedoms. I have been on the ground, shoulder to shoulder, with Nebraskans fighting this at school boards, at meetings, on the streets, holding signs, because it's what I believe in. And that's the kind of leader that I'm going to be of this state. So I ask you, who do you want leading your state? I may not have the same background as you do, and that's good. We need people with different backgrounds, with a different mindset, with a different perspective. We come together, we find solutions that to work for Nebraskans, we implement them, and we sustain them. So thing, again, thank you. Of course, I would appreciate your vote. Right now, we're for governor.com. You can find out more information. And if you have any further questions, please always feel free and do not hesitate to reach out to me. All right, thank you. And Ms. Thibodeau. And I would just like to reiterate my thanks to the Farm Bureau, uh, to our panel who asked such wonderful questions, and thank you for, for moderating. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to speak to all of you here in the audience and the over 55,000 members of the Farm Bureau. It would be an honor to receive your vote in the endorsement of the Farm Bureau. The next governor of Nebraska does need to be bold. The next governor needs to have a sense of urgency. The next governor needs to realize that they report to the citizen, that they need to listen, that the citizens from all over our state need to have a seat at the table, and that you're listening to our citizens about what their needs are, what they are facing every single day. And then it's the next governor's job to work with the state legislature and all the other local authorities to ensure that the right thing happens for Nebraska. It is going to take somebody with a servant's heart, with the passion to serve, the love of Nebraska, and someone that realizes this is about Nebraska, not any one person that is up here on this stage today. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to meeting uh, some of you this afternoon and the rest of you that are on TV throughout my travels across the state. Let's give all six candidates a round of applause. You guys can all, first of all, take a sigh of relief. We all know that that's hard to be on point like that, and we really appreciate you guys taking time out of your Sunday to be here to share with us your thoughts and feelings about what's happening in Nebraska. <coughs> Excuse me. Not only from a sense of what's happening from, from the economy, but what's happening to agriculture and affecting all of us in rural America. We'd like to thank, again, our candidates, Teresa Thibodeau, Brent Lindstrom, Jim Pillen, Charles W. Herbster, Michael Conley, and Braylon Ridenauer. All will be have booths, as you may have seen, for our folks that are in our, our hall tonight or this afternoon. You will see that there are booths out there. You can have a chance at the end of today to be able to walk out, talk to them, and ask them some further questions that maybe you need answered from today's events, from the statements that were made. Of course, big thank you to the Nebraska Farm Bureau, the Nebraska Rural Radio Association, and Nebraska Public Media. You can find a copy of this on the Farm Bureau's YouTube page. Tina Henderson says it will be put up there at a later date. So for folks that are listening or viewing or even here in the audience that want to go back and recapture some of the comments that were made, we encourage you to go there and check that out. Having said that, we really appreciate you guys as an audience sitting here for the last 90 minutes and listening to the statements that were made from all six candidates, keeping your rapport. I know that I watched a lot of you taking notes, and there's a lot of questions and thoughts that you might have of the candidates, and that's what's our opportunity to have in the democracy that we have, and that's to be able to ask those questions of the folks that are up here. We know there will be further events as time goes on, and we'll have further opportunities as you guys are all on the road talking about why you should be the next governor for the state of Nebraska. We want to remind folks the primary is set for May 10th. 
If you don't vote, you really don't have a say in what's going on in this primary as we move on to the final November election. So make sure that you are registered to vote and make sure that you are ready to vote on May 10th. Again, a huge thank you to our panelists sitting in front. If we could give our panelists a round of applause. A question, a question was asked earlier before we started here at 2 o'clock about the panelists. And the questions that were distributed by the panelists came from the panelists themselves. There was no influence from Nebraska Farm Bureau, Nebraska Rural Radio Association, or Nebraska Public Media, nor were there influences from the six candidates you see in front of you. Those questions came solely from our panelists. They include Lori Potter, agricultural reporter and freelance journalist. Steve White, television reporter on NTV, and Elizabeth Rembert. Welcome back home, Elizabeth. By the way, she just moved back from New York. We're glad to have you back in the state of Nebraska, and she represents, yes. She is the food, energy, and agricultural reporter for the Nebraska Public Media. To our listeners who are listening through the Nebraska Rural Radio Association, we appreciate your time, whether you were sitting at your kitchen table, traveling down the interstate, rural back roads, or like the gentleman who texted me earlier, in the tractor because the weather's so good, they're out in the fields getting some work done. We appreciate the fact that you too are taking the time out of your Sunday to listen. And to the folks with Nebraska Public Media, thank you for taking the time to sit in front of your television to be more educated on what's happening in our Republican candidate forum that took place today. Again, Nebraska Farm Bureau, thank you so much for shaving out some time out of your annual convention to be able to host this event here today. And again, we want to remind folks there are booths outside. Each one of the candidates not only has uh, their folks here to help them, they've got some more information about where they're from, some of the things that they believe as they run for Nebraska governor. Let's once again, as we wrap this up, give a round of applause to our six candidates for taking time today. And with that being said, we are wrapping up today. There is an event taking place with Nebraska Farm Bureau members that'll take place next door. We encourage you, if you're a Farm Bureau member, to attend that. And having said that, thank you so much. Safe travels to those that drove, safe travels to our viewers and listeners. I'm Susan Littlefield. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.